Today is the last Sunday in our series around praying and living with the Lord's Prayer. It is also World Communion Sunday. The first Sunday of October, across the whole of the Christian church, there is a time in which we are gathering about the table to uh, realize the length and the breadth, the depth of the body of Christ and its nature expressed most powerfully through Holy Sacrament. It seems like an appropriate handoff, if you will, from what has been focused study around words we say all the time when we gather in worship. And perhaps you pray the Lord's Prayer every day in your own spiritual work to coming to the table of our Lord to say, what now shall we do? Who now shall we be? So it is in that spirit I invite you to rise for the reading of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. The preface here is, there's the query of Jesus from disciples saying, John's disciples pray, teach us to pray. And the response is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We hold these words, don't we? The Lord's Prayer. It doesn't matter if you're incredibly religious or not religious at all or full-on agnostic. You know these words. You've heard them. You may have even said them before. We will, we will pray them in earnest in just a little while, and yet we still struggle to figure out what it means. What it means for us. So to close this, this period of this uh, six-week series on this subject, I, I just want us to think for just a minute about a few things. You'll note that in the Scripture, in each account of it, in the Gospels, if we who grew up Protestant are looking at it, there's something missing here. Save us from the time of trial. Uh, but rescue us from the evil one, period. Well, all the rest of us are conditioned to know what the next line is, right? Which is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That last little doxology there that is not in the Scripture, but I don't think we could handle the last word of these instructions of Jesus being... Um, don't let us come, bring us, do not bring us to the time of trial and rescue us from the evil one. Amen. We have to have for us that last little triumphant lift of heart and of spirit and of hope of what can and by God's grace will yet be. And yet I think that the way that we end the prayer when we pray it robs the power of this last instruction of Jesus in the teaching of his prayer. Do not let us, do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. We know those words differently, right? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Time of trial, temptation. I've thought to myself in reading Crossan's extensive chapter on this, what is it that we take away from that? Temptation from what? Just temptation in life? To be sure, life is full of temptations. Uh, you may be tempted this afternoon at lunch 
to have something that you probably don't need to eat. That's a mini temptation. You may be tempted in life to pursue a path that is counter the way you were raised, the counter the way you were taught, counter the instructions in life that, that hold you and guide you. That's, that's another temptation. We know the nature of all temptations as kind of crystallized and distilled in the temptations of Jesus in the desert. The temptation to be relevant, the temptation to be powerful, the temptation to be spectacular, and all the ways that can live itself out in our daily walk. But I've come as I've lived with this work this past many weeks that it occurs to me that maybe the temptation that Jesus asks us to pray for is really captured in everything that precedes that line of the prayer. We have already prayed that God's kingdom come. We have already prayed that God's will be done on earth as in heaven. We have already prayed that we are given sustenance for this day. And we have prayed that the debts we owe are forgiven as we forgive. All of these things we have already prayed. And it occurs to me that maybe that last clause in the prayer, however it is you want to read it, either as it's recorded here in the bulletin or the way that you know it most readily and we'll pray it here shortly. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil is saying, maybe first and foremost, of all these things that we pray for, let us not be tempted to think that we can achieve it by any means necessary. Let us not take upon ourselves the, thing, the thought that we want God's kingdom to come and we're going to make it happen the way we want. Not necessarily the way God is revealing it to us to live out. What is then this whole thing about how often we will take upon ourselves something that's not really ours to take up. What historically within the Christian church are among all things the crusades, but taking up for yourself a cause to live out in a particular way violently something that the one who came to save us revealed his life of nonviolence. It is tempting, is it not, continually and always to think that the way that we believe God says it must be done excuses our behaviors and how we treat one another. I have a righteous cause, therefore I must now feel free to do you harm collateral damage, but the mission goes on the way I believe it must be. That's tempting. That is a temptation that lives with us in ways great and small. Lead us not into temptation. Don't bring us to the time of trial. Save us from the evil one. Because true enough, when we seek to live out to be partners with the, with the God who has authored this kingdom to come on earth as in heaven, when we seek to partner with God and live it out, and the means by which we do it are anything but loving God and loving neighbor, we have succumbed to the temptation to do it in a way that will ultimately do someone else harm. God, forgive us for all the ways in which that is true.
But this prayer is tinged, wrapped, laced with hope and with grace. The promise of God's kingdom that has come and is coming. Beyond the ways in which we treat each other, beyond the ways in which we abuse one another, the ways in which we take for granted the very bread we pray for, give us this day our daily bread, the ways in which we lean long for God's forgiveness of all that we've done and our resistance to forgive someone else, in the face of all of that, it is still laced with grace and hope. So this morning as we transition from a study of this prayer, we now think about how we live this prayer. And that is our charge going forward, isn't it? Let it be for us that every time those words come out of our mouths, we have taken pause just enough to realize these words are not just words on a page to be prayed or that which we recall because it's been uh, become a part of our routine and memory. These are Jesus' marching orders. And look at it that way. For the kingdom that we pray is coming. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever is one in which God's name is hallowed. In which we work to make God's kingdom real here as in heaven. One in which we work together to make sure that daily bread is available for all. Where we practice the very forgiveness that we yearn for from God. And that in our working out of this kingdom life, we do not take upon ourselves means other than love God with all you have and are and love your neighbor as yourself. When we can get to that place, truly we can with one voice pray the final clause of the Lord's Prayer as we have learned it, that final doxology. Pray it with me. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.